Ghislaine was the chief orchestrator. She engineered everything. You answered to Ghislaine. Even before I met Ghislaine, Jeffrey said, you do not look at Ghislaine, you do not cross her, you do not speak to her, and you do exactly what she says. In the words of Law and Order, sex-based crimes are especially heinous. Whether it be a singular instance of inappropriate conduct or repeated offences of any form of sexual harassment, those who commit these disgusting acts are often considered to be the worst of criminals, especially those who target individuals who cannot consent. Oftentimes, sexual abusers are men, and media often reflects this, owing to why when men, young or old, are taken advantage of by a woman, it is seen as laughable. However, one evil woman in particular accurately shows the lengths that the greedy and moral elite will go to in order to maintain a comfortable lifestyle, regardless of what it may cost a young life. This is an in-depth analysis of the crimes of Ghislaine Maxwell, who, at the end of 2021, was convicted of human trafficking offences and is infamous for her providing Jeffrey Epstein with underage girls. Please consider subscribing if you enjoy my content. Born on Christmas Day of 1961, Ghislaine Noel Marion Maxwell was the epitome of innocence, as all babies are. Really, it's people like her that make you truly wonder whether evil is born or raised. Regardless, the trafficker socialite was born in France on this day before moving to England at a young age. She was raised in Oxford, where she received her education and became a prominent socialite in the 80s. At the age of 30, she moved to New York, continuing her privileged life and beginning a relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. Because of the circumstances of her birth, life, and movements, Ghislaine Maxwell holds tribal citizenship for France, the UK, and the US. This would prove to make her an extremely important asset to Jeffrey Epstein and his trafficking ring, as she could move freely between the three territories as well as colonies belonging to France and the US. This is equivalent to Maxwell being able to access 21 countries with complete ease and without suspicion. Following her birth in 1961, tragedy surrounded her. Not that it's an excuse for being a predator against children, however it does explain some of her other behaviours. She was born the youngest of nine children to a French-born mother and Czechoslovak-born English father. Two days after her birth, her 15-year-old brother was in a car accident which put him in a coma until 1967. Maxwell has spent much of her young life seeing her brother in a vegetative state. According to Ghislaine's mother, this accident impacted heavily on the entire family, but especially Ghislaine. As a young toddler, she was showing signs of anorexia nervosa, an eating disorder which causes body dysmorphia and, in many cases, causes those with the disorder to restrict their intake of food drastically. It is an extremely dangerous disorder, and most people affected by it struggle with it for life. Other than the previous mention of her eating disorder, Maxwell's life is generally recorded as being a life of privilege, with her being oftentimes called her father Robert's favourite child. Regardless of these struggles, she lived a life of immense privilege. Her childhood was spent in a 53-room mansion in Buckinghamshire, and many of the activities of her childhood included sailing the family yacht and visitations with royalty and the aristocracy. In 1991, Ghislaine's life took a dark turn when her father, Robert Maxwell, died in extremely strange circumstances which I'll be taking a look at because the publicity and doubts about friends that came out during the course of the events may give further insight into Ghislaine Maxwell's mentality. After all, are villains born, created, or both? It wasn't unusual for Robert Maxwell to be out sailing his yacht with friends, and it was even less unusual for it to be at such an exotic location as the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa. What was out of the blue, however, was the newspaper tycoon's sudden death, as well as the circumstances leading up to it. Before the man set sail on the Lady Ghislaine, the yacht named after his youngest and most loved daughter, allegations and rumours of Robert Maxwell stealing assets from as many companies were spreading in his social circles. This is where the details get murky. Robert Maxwell was, in fact, embezzling money, and that is where the issue of how he died is raised. The events leading up to November 5th of 1991 had no true credible witnesses. One source, who was on the boat for the duration of Maxwell's cruise, claimed that the man would go to the stern of the yacht every night at 3am and urinate into the water from there. That's a very oddly specific thing for someone to do in private and for someone to know about. It's even weirder when you recall that most luxury yachts do indeed have a toilet. The source of the 3am pissing rumour alleges that Robert jumped to his death rather than being disgraced for the ongoing rumours and held liable. 
However, one French forensic expert claims that Maxwell had been struck in the head peri mortem and otherwise beaten, while the man who identified the body maintains that Robert only had a single graze on his shoulder when he saw it. In fact, the night that Robert Maxwell died happens to be the same day that one of his sons reportedly had a screaming match with him over the phone. He owed company pensions worth £460 million, as well as having £50 million in outstanding loans which he had failed to repay. The official inquest into his death ruled that he had a heart attack before drowning, however this debt of almost half a billion British pounds leads many to believe that he was murdered or committed suicide. How exactly did this death affect Ghislaine Maxwell? How could it lead to a spiral of her committing extremely heinous crimes? Perhaps for financial security reasons. Here's a clip of Ghislaine speaking at an event in memory of her father. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all the many hundreds of people who have sent messages of support to us at this very, very sad time. I want also to thank the press for their courtesy and consideration to my mother and to us at this time, which we appreciate very much. Let's take a moment to dive back into her childhood with some discussions about her relationship with her father as she grew from childhood to adolescence. Most of the incidents I'm about to discuss come from an interview with Anna Pasternak by John Sweeney on his podcast called Hunting Ghislaine. It comes from episode 1, Monsters. We learn a lot about Maxwell's relationship with her father from this interview, as well as other sources within the podcast, which is linked in the description for anyone who'd like to check it out. It goes into a lot more detail. More importantly, we learn a lot about Robert Maxwell. Firstly, Anna states that at first she was surprised at Ghislaine ending up in prison, but the more she followed the trial, the more it made sense to her. Anna knew Ghislaine when the accused was quite young, and blames her relationship with her father as the reason behind Ghislaine's criminal activities, going so far as to call her a daddy's girl. Before I go into detail on Anna's statement, as well as incidents about the Maxwells, I'm going to quickly discuss some of the psychology involved in unhealthy close bonds between a father and daughter. Disproportionately close bonds between a father and daughter can be just as unhealthy, if not more unhealthy, than extremely distant relationships of the same type. However, there are two main directions in which Ghislaine and her father's relationship were going at different points in her life. The first ties into the death of Maxwell's eldest son, which I mentioned earlier. As the eldest, Michael would have been under Robert's wing and training in order to inherit the family business. His death may well have driven Robert Maxwell's stance to become that of an anguished father. He may well have blamed himself for the accident, as he was the one who hired the incompetent driver who fell asleep at the wheel killing his son. Although there is no public record of Robert's feelings about the accident, aside from his wife's memoir describing him as grief-stricken, the only reason that I'm putting forward this theory is because of how this type of relationship affects the daughter in the situation. Daughters in these situations often develop risky behaviours or eating disorders because they believe that when they are self-damaging themselves, the father will stop their own destructive habits to focus on them. The daughters simply do not know how to respond to their own issues or worries due to having a bad role model, thus they willingly hurt themselves. What I'm about to mention next encompasses a variety of disturbing topics including violence, megalomania and child abuse, as well as discussions of dehumanisation by means of humiliation and inappropriate bathroom habits. I'm going to have a few old die putting in chapters on this video so people can skip through the rough stuff, I swear. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to quickly explain what megalomania is. Megalomania may be considered a subsect of Narcissistic Personality Disorder, or NPD. NPD is characterised in the DSM-5 as a disorder in which your moods heavily depend on your sense of self-esteem and grandiose, setting goals related to gaining approval from others and general disregard for the thoughts and feelings of others unless it relates to that person. Those with NPD tend to form only superficial relationships which are often exploited for personal gain. A megalomaniac, on the other hand, seeks to put down others and humiliate them in an attempt to one-up them. They often take extreme behaviours to do so, as you will see in the next piece. Please note that not all narcissists are megalomaniacs, while every megalomaniac is a narcissist. 
Often, people with NPD do not seek to harm others, turning their goals inward instead. While the argument of correlation versus causation, or born or made, does always apply to disorders like this, offspring of adults who have NPD or megalomanic traits tend to inherit the disorder or traits. I, of course, am not qualified in any way to diagnose Ghislaine or her father, but it is another possible explanation for why Ghislaine was so easily able to pawn off these victims for material gain. It's also entirely possible that Ghislaine Maxwell simply learned how to use people based on her own father's actions. As we already know, Robert Maxwell was not above embezzlement and fraud, so it's not too difficult to imagine that he had other lucrative methods of getting what he wanted. Of course, we know already that he had narcissistic and megalomanic tendencies, which I'm now going to detail. Firstly, let's go into some testimonies and interviews given by some of Ghislaine's older siblings about how they were treated by their father. Philip Maxwell is a mathematician and scientist who showed his prowess by earning a scholarship to Balliol College in Oxford at the tender age of 16. Or did he pursue the scholarship in order to escape his overbearing father? The man states that he fled to Argentina to get as far away from his father as possible. The last anyone knows about Philip is that he is working on a book about the abuse his bully father put him through. Anne also agreed that her father was a bully, stating that he often brought her down by insulting her looks. After a failure to launch her acting career, Robert Maxwell is quoted to have viciously joked, What do you and Pope John Paul II got in common? You're both ugly and you're both failed actors. Finally, we have a statement from Ian Maxwell, who has been the most public about being the biggest target of his father's megalomaniac behaviours, wherein he was often ridiculed in front of friends by his father, humiliating him and giving him a severe feeling of inferiority, as well as some pent-up anger. Interestingly enough, none of the other siblings have mentioned anything about Maxwell's treatment of the children, though the domineering father did state that, The thing I'd like to see invented is a way of teaching children and grown-ups the difference between right and wrong. Quite ironic considering how he treated his children, as well as how he treated staff, which is what I'll be getting into now. This is where the triggering stuff starts, so here's a nice picture of a pony to pause at while you check the chapters to skip this part if you need. Back to Anna Pasternik's statement. Anna states that Ghislaine felt that she had to please daddy whatever the cost. Maybe this is what made Ghislaine his favourite daughter. This type of thinking may well have fueled Robert's megalomania and possible narcissistic personality disorder by doing whatever she could to please him, showing the man that he held a great importance. I think he truly believes. It looks to me as if you're almost looking forward to getting involved with a bit of a tussle with Mr. Clough. I have a natural instinct for war, just as he has for words. Sources close to Robert Maxwell have reported that this was, in fact, not the case, as there are many incidents of him partaking in antisocial and aggressive behaviours. For instance, at one point, on top of his famed mirror building, Maxwell urinated on pedestrians below while staff and guests looked on in bewilderment. He took a lot of joy in peeing publicly and defecating with the door open. Reports from staff also state that he used to wipe with clean towels after going to the bathroom and left the scat-encrusted towels all over the place for other people to see and be forced to clean up. Philosopher Bertrand Russell stated that the megalomaniac differs from the narcissist by the fact that he wishes to be powerful rather than charming, and seeks to be feared rather than loved. Megalomaniacs seek to insult and degrade others in order to maintain this feeling of power. Of course, the greatest insult and power play in nature is to mark your territory and seek to embarrass others. It's these behaviours that would lead me to label Robert Maxwell as a megalomaniac rather than a narcissist or sociopath, those who use others for better standing by maintaining useful relationships. But that's not how he maintained power over his favourite daughter. Ghislaine was neglected for attention for most of her formative years, until one day at age three she approached her mother and, in distraught, proclaimed, Mummy. I exist too. The true nature of Ghislaine's relationship with her father in particular is not known, but there are suggestions from those close to Robert Maxwell that he was attracted to his daughter in a sexual manner, and that even in adulthood, Ghislaine would sit in her father's lap and caress him. More troublesome is the fact that Ghislaine would often get a hiding or be beaten by her father, according to one source close to the family. At the age of nine, Ghislaine led a family acquaintance into a room within the Maxwell home where the acquaintance saw a table with row upon row of canes, riding crops, rulers, and a stick. The woman who gave this statement is considered to be very eccentric and may well have made this up. 
However, she did apparently tell the woman, Daddy always allows me what I choose to be beaten with. As if this dynamic couldn't get more messed up, Robert Maxwell's wife allegedly gifted this woman a book by the Marquis de Sade. If you don't know who that author is, he is the where the term sadism comes from. His most famous novel is The 120 Days of Sodom. If you want to know what sodomy is, Google it if you're 16 plus, because I'd like to keep my channel, thank you. While owning a book, which is considered a French classic, is quite common, even though most of them are filled with the Oedipus complex, to own a book by the man behind sadism really says something. Regardless, despite how Robert treated his wife and offspring, which is documented extensively in his widow's memoir, it's clear that Ghislaine adored him and would have done anything to please him based on testament from many of those who were close with her and her family. Witnessing the circumstances around her father's death, it's possible that Ghislaine became obsessed with having a multitude of wealth in order to avoid a fate or disgrace similar to that of her father's. After all, when you're a member of the upper class and were raised with privilege and luxury, reverting to anything less is certainly daunting. With etiquette enforced upon those raised in this environment, as well as being followed by paparazzi for every public appearance, it's no wonder that people in Ghislaine Maxwell's social and economic bracket keep to their own and instead focus on wealth and dignity. Perhaps in her young and independent adult life, Ghislaine came to realise that owning a women's club, being a director of Oxford United Football Club, and working small jobs for a magazine wasn't bringing in enough money to afford her the life of luxury that she was accustomed to. Being a prominent socialite, Maxwell had a large pool of people that she had access to, of whom she could have easily have consulted about high-paying activities. In fact, Ghislaine Maxwell met Jeffrey Epstein in the very same year that her father died at sea. She herself stated this in 2016 while giving evidence in court. It was after her father's death that the twisted socialite moved to New York. It's important to note that the townhouse she lived in while in New York had its lease in Epstein's name. After her father's death, Maxwell began to lean heavily on Epstein and began to enforce an outward image of the pair being a couple. This is up for debate for many reasons, which I will explain later. There is no established timeline of when Epstein and Maxwell began their exploitation of underage people, however, one court case, that of Jane Doe v. Maxwell and Epstein's estate in 2020, alleges that the two recruited a 13-year-old in 1994 and sexually abused her. This is the earliest timeline documentation of accusations of sexual abuse on minors by Maxwell and Epstein. In fact, the victim infers that Maxwell took part in sexual abuse several times over the course of the four years that she was under recruitment of the pair. The victim's exact statement was that Ghislaine regularly facilitated Epstein's abuse and was frequently present when it occurred. So, perhaps then, money wasn't the sole motivator in Maxwell's participation of Epstein's infamous sex trafficking ring. If she did indeed get involved in the rape of the minors, then it's time to dive into some of the psychology behind sex traffickers in general, from what gets them involved to causes of their sexual deviance. Generally, traffickers use psychological tactics to protect their own minds from the horrors of what they are subjecting their victims to. One such tactic is that of distortion. The Japanese government are the pinnacle of examples of legal traffickers using distortion to distance themselves from the actual term for what they are doing. That's right, the Japanese government are traffickers. Remember that a trafficker, as defined by end slavery now, is anyone who uses force, fraud or coercion to exact work and profit from others. The Japanese government at present has an internship program which is marketing for foreign workers to combat their labour shortage, listing these positions as opportunities to hone transferable skills. Oftentimes, foreign workers become trapped in debt, bondage, and absolutely must take low-paying jobs to offset this debt. This form of internships is very much indentured servitude, also known as labour trafficking. Another form of self-protection by traffickers is rationalisation. For example, they will take someone from extreme poverty or in a job that does not pay enough and begin to sell that person's body as a pimp. In the trafficker's mind, they are giving the victim work opportunities and effectively saving them from poverty. However, traffickers will often take these mental gymnastics to the next level and justify to themselves that if I don't traffic people, someone else will. This is the exact mindset recorded in sex traffickers in Tenancingo, Mexico. Obviously, these people haven't had their parents ask them, if your friends all jumped off of a bridge, would you? In childhood. Traffickers will also often make a social comparison between themselves and other traffickers in order to justify themselves and dissociate from a more brutal image. For example, 
An elderly Thai woman who trafficked Rohingya Muslims claimed that this was an act of charity which saved these Muslims from ethnic cleansing in Myanmar. In fact, she even stated herself to be ethical because she didn't mistreat the refugees. Blame shifting is another pathetic excuse used by traffickers. They will oftentimes be working for somebody who is a more formidable force and need the money the trafficking brings in. Blame shifting arguments might start off with the following. The company owner will shut down our factory if we don't produce the daily quota. So, I hire children from rural areas to operate dangerous machinery and lock them in the factory so that they can keep working. I can't fight the company because it's too powerful, and I can't adopt more ethical policies because that would lower productivity, close down the factory, and I'd be out of a job. It's really the rich company owner that enslaves these children, not me. Another strategy is dehumanising trafficked individuals. By dehumanising their charges, traffickers completely strip them of their identity and often see them as subhuman or inferior and deserving of exploitation. Oftentimes, it is socially accepted norms such as social class and gender-based violence which makes the process of dehumanising someone much easier for the trafficker. It's also often an established and automatic paw applied as the trafficker meets victims. In fact, human trafficking actually thrives in societies where certain groups of people are already marginalised and abused. Abusers often go unpunished in these places because perpetrators are not seen as having committed wrongdoing against someone. A major example of this is the trafficking of LGBTQ plus Indian youth, where conversion camps and corrective rape are normalised and oftentimes encouraged or paid for. However, it's not always just the traffickers who use these defence mechanisms. Oftentimes, traffickers have a network of people who know about the trafficking and do nothing about it, contributing to the cycle of enslavement. Even unknowing consumers contribute to the problem. There are those among us who have denied, distorted, and rationalised ourselves into buying slave-made products, often items of clothing, both fast fashion and name brand. We've elevated ourselves by saying, at least we don't purchase sex or prostitute others. Of course, this is not targeting those who literally cannot afford any other options, and the fashion industry almost exclusively uses slave labour to make their clothing, shoes and bags. Because of this, we've deemed the problem much too big to solve, and being too beyond our personal influence as a direct result of capitalism, and leaving it to the authorities and governments. This has made everyone a player in the dehumanisation process. Instead of asking, how could somebody do this to another human, a child, a dependent, we should instead be asking, how could I let our governments and businesses do this? How could I not force them to resolve this? It is absolutely possible that Maxwell was using any one of these rationalizations, but is it also possible that she was doing it out of love for Epstein? Victims of Epstein and Maxwell often testified that the pair had a relationship similar to that of teenagers. During the time in which the crimes took place, Ghislaine was in her thirties while Jeffrey was almost a decade her senior. Regardless, the girls who were recruited often described their relationship as playful, intimate, and doting, often reminiscent of new relationships of those in teens. Epstein and Maxwell were being very playful with each other, kind of grabbing each other as they waited to go into the theatre, one victim said. Miss Maxwell pulled down Epstein's pants a little bit in front of her, she continued. It seemed odd, the girl said, alleging that the behaviour from Epstein and Maxwell was a form of role play that came before the abuse of the young girls. In fact, the mother of the victim I'm currently quoting testified that Epstein had attempted to ease her concerns about the New Mexico trip by telling her his wife, Ghislaine, would be chaperoning girls at the ranch they were visiting. However, Epstein and Maxwell are not married, and exact details of their relationship were largely kept hidden, even from those who knew and worked for them for decades. It's possible that Maxwell's own family weren't even aware of the true status of the pair's relationship. A second accuser, who testified under the pseudonym Kate, said Maxwell had described Epstein as her boyfriend when they met at her London townhouse in the early 1990s. This may have been the case, or was it yet another predatory technique used by the pair to gain the trust of underage girls? She told me lots of amazing things about her boyfriend. She said that he was a philanthropist, and that he liked to help young people, and that at some point it would be really wonderful for me to meet him, Kate told the court. Once Kate did meet Epstein, the conversation took on a more explicitly sexual tone, as Maxwell allegedly encouraged her to massage him and praised her for being a good girl for complying. A third accuser, who testified under the first name Carolyn, told the court that she had seen photographs of a pregnant Miss Maxwell. 
There was multiple pictures, nude photos, Carolyn testified during cross-examination from defense attorney Jeffrey Paglucha. Paglucha showed Carolyn a photo which was not shared publicly in court, but the witness denied it being the same photo. Another witness claimed to have seen the photo too, however she claimed that the photo was actually of Eva Anderson Dubin. Larry Vizoki, who was Epstein's private pilot from 1991 to 2019, was asked by the court to describe Epstein's relationship to Maxwell. He claimed that the relationship was more personal than business, adding, I wouldn't characterise it as romantic. Epstein's other long-term pilot, David Rogers, called to testify in the trial second week. Early on, they were romantically involved. Both pilots said that Maxwell was Epstein's number two and oversaw every aspect of running his household, including hiring staff, booking his private jet flights, and approving their expense accounts. Another former Epstein employee, Juan Alessi, described Miss Maxwell as the girlfriend of Mr. Epstein. Although even the staff aren't entirely sure of their relationship, most testify that there was at least partially a romantic aspect to their relationship at some point in time. Did Maxwell have a paramantic relationship with Epstein? According to many staff at Epstein's Palm Beach mansion during the 1990s, Maxwell enforced extremely strict standards on employees. She was often described as the lady of the house and enforced a 58-page manual which outlined in detail exactly how staff were to dress, act, and even answer questions made by officials at the time. More shockingly, in a section titled Grooming and Guest Relations, there was a guideline where staff were instructed to see nothing, hear nothing, say nothing, except to answer a question directed at you. This could be interpreted innocently enough as a couple who wants privacy in their relationship. However, within this context, it could also be instructing staff to turn a blind eye to the abuse being inflicted on teenagers in the villa. Mr. Alessi also testified that he was ordered to remove all traces of Miss Maxwell from the home when Epstein was hosting other female guests. This itself is curious, because when the FBI raided Epstein's townhouse in Manhattan in 2019, they found a multitude of evidence linking him romantically to Maxwell. This evidence was found recorded on CDs as well as on multiple hard drives. Dozens of photos of the pair showed them kissing and embracing intimately on yachts, private jets, and at black tie events. Some photos even showed them lounging outside together at the Queen's Balmoral Estate in Scotland. One of the more intimate photos showed Maxwell massaging Epstein's feet and rubbing them against her cleavage on a private jet. Even if all of this isn't evidence of a relationship, one document created on Word, which is found on a hard drive at the aforementioned Manhattan townhouse, seemed to testify to the fact that Maxwell had a great interest in keeping up the appearance of being a couple. The Word document was created in 2002 by a user called GMAX, and it stated that Jeffrey and Ghislaine have been together, a couple, for the last 11 years. They are, contrary to what people think, rarely apart. I always see them together. Ghislaine is highly intelligent and great company with a ready smile and an infectious laugh. This strange letter went on to say, Jeffrey and Ghislaine complement each other really well and I cannot imagine one without the other. On top of being great partners, they are also the best of friends. A defence attorney quizzed an FBI investigator who had cloned the hard drive about whether someone else other than Miss Maxwell could have authored the letter, but its purpose was never fully explained. During the two weeks of evidence giving, prosecutors maintained that Miss Maxwell had a financial motive in ensuring Epstein's sexual demands were satisfied. She had not been a particularly wealthy person when she met Epstein in the early 1990s, they said during pre-trial arguments. This would lend itself to the theory that Ghislaine was supplying Epstein with underage girls in exchange for financial assistance. In fact, federal prosecutor Lara Pomerantz stated that Maxwell abused these victims as a means to support her lifestyle. The assistant district attorney went on to elaborate that Ghislaine Maxwell was attempting to keep Epstein happy so that she could stay in the lifestyle to which she was accustomed. After all, with her mogul father dead, Ghislaine Maxwell needed a new benefactor to support her. Mr. Rogers, the second pilot to testify, said that after her father's death, Miss Maxwell moved on from her very large residence on 59th Street on Manhattan's Upper East Side to a small studio apartment on 84th Street. One of the testifiers also stated that Ghislaine had informed her that Epstein had bought her a property in New York. The prosecution then called in an executive from J.P. Morgan, a global leader in financial services, in order to question them. The executive testified that Jeffrey Epstein had wired Maxwell $30.7 million between 1999 and 2007. 
Further bank records showed that Ghislaine had purchased a 7.35 million helicopter in June of 2007, soon after a transfer for a similar amount was received from Epstein. In response to this evidence, Maxwell's attorneys attempted damage control by minimising her relationship with Jeffrey Epstein, claiming that the socialite was simply being used as a scapegoat for Epstein's own crimes. They went on to say that the way in which Epstein compartmentalised his life meant that even those closest to him knew nothing of his true personality or feelings. They then pointed to the committed relationship Maxwell had with Ted White, yet another wealthy businessman who owned his own private planes and was the CEO of Gateway Computers. Does this mean, then, that Maxwell recruited the young girls out of greed for money? In 2016, she gave a deposition, or evidence in layman's terms, that after Epstein had been jailed, she had continued to work at his properties on occasion while also keeping ties with him. In her statement, she claimed to be a very loyal person. She went on to say that Jeffrey was very good to her after her father's passing. Ewan Relly, an investment banker who attended dinner parties that she and Mr. Epstein hosted in New York, said that she seemed to be half ex-girlfriend, half employee, half best friend, and fixer. In July 2019, Epstein was arrested by law enforcement when he arrived on a private jet in New Jersey from France, and he was charged with sex trafficking and sex trafficking conspiracy. Some months later in August, Epstein was found dead in his Manhattan prison cell while he awaited trial with a medical examiner ruling the 66-year-old's death suicide. I won't be getting into conspiracy around that for obvious reasons. After Epstein's death, the question of how did he get these girls was raised. Main accuser, Virginia Jouffre, pointed her finger to Ghislaine Maxwell, stating that she was a very important part of the process of recruiting underage girls to be abused. Law enforcement then turned their attention to the socialite who, with her personal fortune of $20 million and passports for three separate administrative areas, had disappeared completely. Almost exactly one year after Epstein's arrest, the FBI raided a remote estate in New Hampshire where Miss Maxwell was found living. She had a slither the way to a gorgeous property in New Hampshire, continuing to live a life of privilege while her victims continued to live with the trauma inflicted upon them years ago, said Bill Sweeney the assistant director of the FBI's New York field office, as he confirmed her arrest. Prosecutors say that Maxwell refused to answer the door to agents who were forced to break it down and take her into custody. On the 29th of December, a jury found Maxwell guilty on five federal sex trafficking charges. She was found not guilty of one charge, enticing a minor to travel to engage in illegal sex acts. Maxwell could face a maximum sentence of 40 years in prison with these charges. Count 1. Conspiracy to entice a minor to travel to engage in illegal sex acts, maximum sentence of 5 years. Count 2. Enticing a minor to travel to engage in illegal sex acts, maximum sentence of 5 years. Count 3. Conspiracy to transport a minor with the intent to engage in criminal sexual activity, maximum sentence of 5 years. Count 4. Transporting a minor with the intent to engage in criminal sexual activity, maximum sentence of 10 years. Count 5. Conspiracy to commit sex trafficking of minors. Maximum sentence of 5 years. Count 6. Sex trafficking of minors. Maximum sentence of 40 years. Maxwell's legal team quickly began working on her appeal and launched a separate bid for a retrial after one of the original jurors spoke to the press and revealed he had a personal history of sexual abuse. The defense has said that Juror 50, who spoke publicly under his first name, Scotty David, lied about his personal history in a pre-trial verdict, which resulted in an unfair trial. The juror appeared in court on the 8th of March to answer questions on the issue before Judge Allison Nathan rules on the motion for a retrial. He told the judge that while he was going through the paperwork, he was being distracted and answered incorrectly by accident. The retrial was not granted. The latest update in Ghislaine's trial takes place in late April of 2022. She lost her appeal to overturn the sex trafficking conviction she faces, updating her possible maximum sentence to 55 years. Her actual sentence will not take place until June of 2022, but I think I can speak for all of us when I say she deserves to spend her life in the prison instead of meeting the same fate as her financier. If she were to share a fate with Epstein, who also died under suspicious conditions, she would be the third person in this case to commit suicide, or so they say. Of course, there is no need to cover the conspiracy of Jeffrey Epstein's death. The memes and news coverage that spread from his debated suicide in 2019 are still fresh in everyone's minds. I will mention, however, that he managed to die on 24-hour suicide watch when cameras mysteriously shut off and the guards who were meant to be watching him for those 24 hours disappeared from their post. Great work. 
However, this section is about Jean-Luc Brunel, a modelling agent and longtime friend of Epstein. In December of 2020, the disgraced man was charged with the rape and sexual harassment of minors over 15. While Brunel was not on suicide watch, the prison guards conducted five checks per night on prisoners. Camera footage from that night shows that the guards did not miss any of these checks. Brunel's lawyers and spokesperson stated that his decision to take his own life came from a place of injustice rather than guilt, as he had always maintained his innocence. This doesn't really have much to do with Ghislaine Maxwell as a whole, I just thought it was an interesting coincidence in regards to the case. What isn't a coincidence, however, is the path that Ghislaine took in life. From her childhood to present, she has followed a life of privilege and surrounded herself with wealthy men in order to continue to live her life of luxury. Not once has she come forward to apologise to the victims or shown any remorse for her role in the trafficking ring. Even in the wake of the investigation, she fled to a remote estate where she continued to surround herself with luxury and commodity for over a year before she was apprehended. This action itself says more about her character and motivations than any video essay or court investigation could. Narcissist or not, she has and always will put herself first, vehemently denying any accusations regardless of proof or victim's pain. Ghislaine Maxwell, Jeffrey Epstein and Jean-Luc Brunel are just three of over 78,000 traffickers convicted from 2007 to 2020. Because of this, I urge you to support the petition and charity I've left in the description of this video. There are so many more traffickers out there and millions of victims who need resources to find them and support them. If you have been affected by the material discussed in this video, you can find some mental health resources and hotlines also in the description. This has been an insanely difficult video to research due to personal experiences and those of people close to me. Please seek help or justice if you can. The closure will help above all else. Be safe out there and always be careful about those you can trust. Thanks for watching.